that, but to see all of our friends and brothers and sisters and and uh, this the uh, just an uplifting time to get to to see everyone. Just a few announcements, and we'll turn our services over to Steve. Uh, if you're visiting, thank you for being for choosing us to worship with today, and we hope that everything that we say and do will be in accordance to God's will. And furthermore, on that, if you're visiting in our foyer, we have a few rooms. We have, of course, our restrooms on the left-hand side and a soothing and training room on the right-hand side. So please, if you're visiting, feel free to take uh, advantage of any of those uh, that need be. Uh, of course, for our members, you know we have our new online giving app. So you're, be, uh, you're welcome to use that. Uh, we need a little bit of help. Like we said last week, there are sign-up sheets on the uh, back table uh, for anyone that would like to help fill, prepare the communion trays. So if you can help in that way, please put your name on the back table. Uh, we also need, uh, we are in desperate need of some new, some van drivers. And also, our new benevolence building is up and running. Uh, Paul Benson. Uh, is taking charge of that. So uh, if you would like to donate basically anything but clothes, please see Paul, and we can always use volunteers in that aspect. So uh, what, a, what a great ministry. So please see Paul and uh, get involved with that aspect. Uh, of course, we know uh, we have the funeral here tomorrow, so uh, be sure, and if you would, please, when you leave, just take a, a moment to make sure everything's kind of tidied up around where you're sitting. Uh, the January 29th is our uh, our young man will lead our services in the evening. So uh, Jimmy is taking care of that. So if you'd like for your young gentleman to participate in that, please see Jimmy and uh, let's get involved in our youth-led worship. Uh, one other thing is on Northtown Church of Christ, our Facebook page. We're working on that, but there has been a few mysterious posts. So if you see a mysterious post on our Facebook page, do not click on it. They're in process of working that over, trying to get it lined out. But a, a mysterious post, do not click. So a, a, if I was on there, they would all look mysterious. But a... a yeah, they're working on that, and we'll get. They're going to get that lined down. Uh, thank you for being here, and I'll turn the services over to Steve. Oop, I'm on. Oh, there we go. Okay, move it up a little bit more. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Whenever you're ready, Clark. Let's begin with number nine hundred four. Nine hundred four. Say one verse. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His gracious power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are you gone as fathers are the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Number 66. 66. Six. Praise God, to whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Number 72. Number 72. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. And your people declare your mighty words. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. 
Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord. With all of my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy, Lord. Number 123, this will be the song of worship. 123. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my fortune, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in you. Therefore, I will hope Prayers in addition to what's in our book, and then he's on our list here. Uh, Tom Baxter is here this morning. Uh, Kayla Hamilton is in the lady that attends with Tom and Brenda. Uh, had to have her appendix out as recovering. David's got a sore arm, and he's requested uh, prayers for that and for all of the tenants that are in the nursing homes. I don't want to go for David's. Where he's at there, but all it's a different lifestyle for us. We're thankful to have the nursing homes and the that they have to care for our sick ones, but it is a lonesome place. Uh, we keep all of them in our prayers. And Kayla Hamilton, I got that one, I'm sorry. Uh, Lake and Woods, I guess, would be her name. Dalton Woods, uh, grand, great granddaughter of Larry and Sandra, had a pretty serious surgery this morning. Uh, St. Francis had to take her up there. And she uh, is going to have some time in healing, and hopefully that, that will, will take place. And I don't know how to tell you what the surgery is, so just know that it's reasonably serious and we're concerned for the young lady. If you will, please uh, join me in prayer this morning. Father, Almighty God, we thank you so much for being our God, and for the love that you have for us, and allowing of your Son to, to give his life for us, and hope that we have for forgiveness of sin through him, Father. We just pray that you will continue to forgive us. Help us to be the people, Father, that you want us to be. Help us to worship you this morning and give you the glory and the praise for all that we have, all that we are, or ever will be, and all that we have here, Father, the, the brothers and sisters that we have to come together and to worship you. We pray, Father, that that will be acceptable to you this morning. It will be uplifting and encouraging to us. Be with Steve as he continues to lead us in song, and be with Randy as he brings us the lesson this morning. Be with each one of us and help us, Father, to listen tentatively to that word and, and allow it to encourage us, to allow it to lift our lives up, to be better servants to you. Father, for all of our sick that are struggling and hurting with different elements of life, we pray for Tom and for Michaela and for David and all that are in the nursing homes. Lakin, the little girl that had the surgery, Father, we pray for her and just pray that she'll have her full recovery and be with her family as they are concerned with her. Uh, we pray for all of our cancer patients, Father, and the list is long. Jeff Yant, Karen Vaughn, Bobby Vaughn, Barbara McClellan, Felita Sorrells, 
Luana Suddeth, Gloria Wynn, Joanne Crawley, Joni Crawley. Father, we ask you to, to be with them and, and give them the courage that they need to face the treatments that they're taking. And pray that they will be successful, Father, that they can return to a degree of health that is livable and, and can be in service to you. We pray for all, Father, Jack Pitts, Arlen Rowe, Don Brewer, Stan Beck, Jan Terry, John. Uh, just help us, Father, to or help them to, to heal and to, to be able to return to service to you. For those that have lost loved ones, Father, we pray that you'll be with the Wilson family uh, at the time of the loss of Frank, and, and he's a great loss to your service or to your kingdom here on earth, Father. But we know that Frank was ready and, and was prepared to face you, and we just were so thankful for the life that he's lived. We ask you, Father, to forgive each one of us of our shortcomings. We, we are weak often, Father, and fail to be the people you want us to be, to be the example that we can be. We just pray that you will forgive us when we fail to do that. Be with all of our Bible class teachers, Father. We're so thankful for them. Be with our young people in this face life challenges that they face. Uh, we pray, Father, they'll look to you for guidance and that uh, they will live to serve you. Be with all of us to do that, Father. We pray again for our worship to be acceptable to you, be uplifting to us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Number 753, 753, let's we'll sing three verses. Tempted and tried, we were all made to wonder why it should be the call of a day Why the rock of a mother, never broke Thank you. 
Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful this morning for the, the freedom and the privilege we have together around this table. Father, at this time, we'd ask that you would help us to focus all of our attention and thoughts on you and your son, Father. We're thankful for this bread, which represents the body of your son that was given. And we pray that we will take of it in a manner worthy of the grace that was shown that day. It's in his blessed name that we pray. Amen. To bow with me, please. Our Father, we thank you so much for our ability to be here this morning and gather around this table in honor of thy Son. Father, we now partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood that was shed on our behalf for the remission of our sins. Father, and now I ask that we can do so with an open heart and open mind and in a manner that is pleasing to you. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you so much for everything in our lives. Every good thing we have comes from you. Everything we have is yours. Father, let us now give a portion of what you've richly blessed us with back to your service and do it with a cheerful heart because we know your word says you love a cheerful giver. In Christ's name, amen. Number 446, 446, let's see. Hero is Ryan, the Lord thy God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy soul. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy strength. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy might. Hear, O Israel. If you're using a hymn book, our invitation is all in number 778. 778. Great to see you here this morning. It's encouraging to see you here. And it's encouraging for us to have this time together to study and to worship together. Appreciate the songs and the prayers this morning as we gather together to worship this first day of the week together. What a great way to, to start a week. And again, it's just an encouragement for you to be here and, uh, and an honor for me to have an opportunity to share with you from, from God's Word this morning. Um, as we continue in our study, as we have been through the life of Christ, and I know I mentioned that uh, our study uh, for our, our year-long commitment is about to come to an end here within a week or so, and we'll begin a new study. But uh, I say that with the, the point that being that we never stop studying the life of Christ. So that's, that's a, a never-ending study. So hopefully what we've studied has helped deepen our understanding and maybe even encouraged us more uh, in, in a better appreciation uh, to who our Lord is and, uh, and how Scripture comes alive to us. When we really study Scripture and we dig into Scripture, it comes alive. Uh, it's, it's living and active, as the Hebrew writer tells us. And so it, it's very alive for us. It's very relevant to our lives. So hopefully we see that as we dig in and we study together. And hopefully things I share with you are encouraging to you as the things that you share with me are definitely an encouragement to me And uh, as we study together. I want to ask you this morning, uh, you had those days of just an emotional roller coaster. I think we all have, hadn't we? Maybe you wake up that morning and you're having a pretty good day. You're feeling pretty good about the day. But you get a phone call or an incident happens. And all of a sudden your day is turned upside down. And your emotions go from way up here to way down here. I think we've all experienced those days, those phone calls, those incidents in our lives that just turn our world upside down. Or have you had those days to where you wake up 
and you've not had a good few days and you wake up and you're kind of in a depressed state, and maybe something happens that day, maybe you get some news that day or something happens to where that turns into a positive for you. And all of a sudden that day that started out on such a negative start and such a downer start, it ends with great positive things to carry through with you through your day. I think we all know those experiences. And I want to share one with you this morning from Scripture to help us understand and see that even Jesus' disciples, they experience those days just like we do. And particularly this morning as we think about Jesus' appearance to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. A stranger appears to them this day. Now here we've talked about the resurrection of Jesus. He's been raised. We talked about Mary going to the tomb last week. He's had some appearances to some disciples. But there's two disciples in this passage today in Luke 24 who they're leaving Jerusalem and they're on their way to Emmaus. Emmaus was a little town about seven miles from Jerusalem. Even scholars today, they're not sure exactly where Emmaus was, or was, but it was seven miles away. This passage tells us that. So they're leaving Jerusalem. We know one of them, their names was Cleopas. The other disciple were not told his name. But they were probably headed home. Maybe many think they're headed home from the Passover weekend. Maybe that's where they were going. But the events of what had happened are definitely on their minds. And we know the condition of the disciples because Mark tells us, Mark 16, 10, she went, referring to Mary, she had been to the tomb, and when she reported to those who had been with him, she reported it to him while they were mourning and weeping. You see, their day didn't start out very well. They had experienced seeing, knowing of the death of their Lord. He'd been buried. Their last couple of days have been filled with mourning and weeping. And so we know the condition of these two disciples. For whatever reason, they've decided we're not going to stay in Jerusalem. Maybe it's just it's too much of a downer. We need to get home. We just need to go home. So they start on their journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they have a stranger joins them on that journey. You know, it's not unusual, it wasn't unusual for you on the road outside of Jerusalem to run across strangers because there's a lot of people traveling in and, in and about Jerusalem. It was a very busy, traveled city. And so on this occasion, they're traveling outside of Jerusalem on that road to Emmaus, and it says a stranger joins them or someone they didn't recognize. Well, they're going about their conversation. And in Luke 24 Verse 17, we're going to deal with sadness. A day that begins with sadness. And we've all experienced days like that. Luke records for us in Luke 24, 17, as this stranger joins these two disciples who are on the road, he, he overhears their conversation. And as you read the passage, we're going to understand, we're going to know that it's Jesus they don't recognize it's Jesus. And we're told whether, for whatever reason, they don't recognize it's Jesus. We talked about that in class this morning. Whether He doesn't totally reveal Himself to them. Whatever the occasion is, their sorrow may have kept them from knowing it was Jesus. But they don't recognize it's Jesus. And so in verse 17 it says, And He said to them, Jesus says to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And it says, And they stood still, looking sad. Their countenance was down. They were confused about what's happened the last couple of days. And they were saddened by it. And it says they stood still. It's almost like you, you think this, this stranger joins them and saying, what, are you, what is this I'm hearing? What are you saying? And it's like they stop in their tracks. They stood still. And they look at the stranger. And Cleophas says this, Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here these days? And he said to them, What things? Jesus, Jesus is inducing their heavy hearts to express their grief and disappointment. He wants them to express what they're feeling. And Jesus says to them, What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of all God and all the people. 
of God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman also had said, but him they did not see. Said, how, how did, can you see what he's saying? How do you, have you not heard? Are you, are, are, are you such a, you don't have any clue what's going on? The whole city's in a buzz about it and you don't know? So Cleopas explains to him, We've heard these things. Women went to the tomb. They claim they saw him. Others, others say that they just know he wasn't there. And so it's just, it's been three days. And we don't, most scholars think they're not thinking about the resurrection because we're told that they didn't even understand that Jesus said, three days I'll rise again. They missed that. But they're just saying, and now it's been three days, time slipping by, and it's just, there's, it's just uh, something they're totally confused about. That those were maybe just idle tales they were hearing from those in Jerusalem. And they decide, we're just, we're just going to leave. They must not have believed too much about these tales they were hearing because they didn't stay around to investigate. If they really thought about these things, they would have probably stayed going, we got to find out what's going on. But they just pushed them off probably as idle tales. And we're, we're just going to leave. It's just, they're just too down. They're just too depressed. Because they were hoping that He would redeem Israel. And their idea of redemption was he was going to be, again, their warrior king who is going to deliver them from Roman bondage. And we understand that's not the kingdom that Jesus came to present. So they were dealing with sadness. A great sadness for them. Their hopes have been dashed. The rumors that the body had disappeared, they believed to be true. But what should they believe? They didn't know but they had, they had not seen Him. So these disciples did not know exactly what to believe. So again, they left town. I wonder if that's why Jesus appeared to these disciples. Because He knew how downtrodden he, they were. He knew they were leaving the city. And Jesus joins them, not them not able to really understand who He was, for them to convey where their hearts were. So we see this sadness as their day begins. Then we also see another emotion that happens this day. We see enlightenment. Now think about the enlightenment. Luke tells us, Luke 24, 25 through 27, Jesus responds to Cleopas. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into His glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself and all the Scriptures. they still not recognizing who this is. And Jesus begins to talk to them. Now the foolish men, He calls them foolish men, but He did not call them fools in the sense that we speak of people being fools today. The original means dull of perception. Dull of understanding. You foolish men, you, you don't understand. You're not perceiving what Scripture says. And they had read what the prophets had spoken, but they'd failed to make the application to Jesus. He further represented them as slow of heart. But you foolish men, and you're slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken to you. They did not see. They were slow in heart believing all that the prophets had said concerning the Messiah. They did not see that the sufferings of Jesus, crucifixion, His resurrection, all predicted by the prophets. And here Jesus is declaring that these things had to happen. Josh McDowell has written a lot of evidence that demands a verdict, done a lot of research in the prophecies a lot of other writers have. There's over 300 prophecies about the Messiah over 300. Over 300 prophecies that are fulfilled. And I wonder in this conversation, it says Jesus, beginning with Moses and with the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself in the Scriptures. I wonder where Jesus started. 
Can't you wonder, what did Jesus start telling them? Did He tell them some of the prophecies of what had just occurred the last couple of days? Did He tell them about Amos 8 verse 9 where Amos prophesies, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. We talked about the three hours of darkness last week. It was prophesied about. Did Jesus tell the disciples about Amos? That darkness that you saw is prophecy. Did He tell them about Isaiah? When Isaiah writes, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet He was with a rich man in His death because He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in His mouth. Isaiah had prophesied that Jesus would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Did Jesus share this prophecy with them? They knew that the tomb where Jesus was about Joseph of Arimathea. We assume the disciples did. Did Jesus refer back to Isaiah? It says He started with Moses. Jesus started with Moses with these disciples. Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning, to the prophets, even Moses saying, God will raise up a prophet like me. He's explaining to them, Scripture has been pointing to this day. Scripture has been pointing to Jesus the Nazarene. Acts 3 verse 22 is quoted there of what Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. They quote from Deuteronomy there. Jesus starts at Moses to explain to them what happened and the prophecies that were there. Scripture gives us enlightenment. And John tells us in John 5 verse 46, for if you believe Moses, you should believe me for He wrote about me. Study the Scriptures for better understanding. Enlightenment can change our sadness. When we study Scripture, when we better understand the promises that God has given to us, when we better understand the sacrifice of Jesus, when we become enlightened by Scripture and better understanding, it can take away our sadness. And that's what Jesus is doing. How does He take away their sadness? He enlightens them through Scripture. These things weren't done by accident. This was God's will being fulfilled. And if you'll study Scripture and understand Scripture better, as Jesus expounds to them, it takes away your sadness. Being in Scripture takes away our sadness. God's given us His Word His promises. And then the last item of emotion, which I've already showed you, is excitement. Excitement. A day that starts with sadness, a day because of Scripture, they're going to be enlightened about God's promises. They're going to be enlightened through God's Word about what God has done for them and about what these things mean. In a better understanding of God's Word, it's going to bring about excitement and joy in their lives. So we see this roller coaster of emotion from sadness, enlightenment. We're going to see excitement as they begin to understand what Luke continues to record for us. Then their eyes were open and they recognized Him as they go on to to journey together at the meal. We'll look at that a little bit more. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the Scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, the Lord is really risen, and he's appeared to Simon. So see, what happens on this journey is getting late, and they asked Jesus, why don't you, Jesus was going to continue journey, And they said, why don't you come in and share a meal with us after they got to Emmaus. And Jesus shares the meal with them. And that's when He prays and reveals Himself to them. And they make this response. So it's late late in the evening. So they've told Him to come in because it's late. But because of what they have just found out about Jesus, they've been enlightened through Scripture, and they've witnessed Jesus' resurrection. 
They're excited enough to where we're going back to Jerusalem right now. We're not waiting till tomorrow. We don't care how late it is. We got to go find the other disciples. Their day changed from sadness to excitement and to great joy because they've been enlightened by the scriptures and they had seen Jesus Christ raised from the dead. You see, enlightenment can bring us joy. Enlightenment in scripture can bring us joy when we have better understanding. We think about Peter, or Paul had that excitement in his life. When he can say while he was in prison, and he's wrote Philippians, the, the whole message of Philippians is to rejoice in the Lord. Paul's saying, rejoice in the Lord. He's in prison when he writes this. And Paul's going to die a martyr's death at the hands of the Romans. But he writes, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He continues this idea. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Because Paul was enlightened by God's Word and by knowing that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so it brings joy in our lives. It brings joy regardless of the circumstances of our lives. Acts 16, verse 25, when Paul and Silas were in the inner stocks of the prison, they had been beaten. They had been thrown into the inner stocks of the prison. And Luke records in Acts 16, 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and to the prisoners who were listening to them. They're in prison. They've been beaten. They're in stocks. And they're singing and praising to God because they've been enlightened because they knew who God was, they knew who Jesus was, and it gave them joy. And regardless of what circumstance they faced. Dr. Bill Flatt, he's a Bible professor, <clears throat> Christian family therapist, taught at the Harding Graduate School of Theology for many years. I think he's since retired. He wrote a book called Mental Health in the Bible. And he makes this comment about joy I want to share with you. <clears throat> joy is deeper than happiness. Happiness is a natural result of the external conditions of one's life. Joy springs from deep within a person's inner being from a stream that continues to run, though circumstances are adverse. Joy is possible even without good health, friendly neighbors, or favorable circumstances. Joy is what we receive through Christ when we've been enlightened through His Word and, he, and we understand His promises, we have joy. It's greater than happiness. Happiness is that point in time just of an external condition. But joy runs deeper. Joy goes regardless of what circumstances we face. It's what the Apostle Paul, why he could rejoice in prison, why he could rejoice in hardship. And I think about this passage in Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Wouldn't it be great if we could start every day, if we could start every morning with these words on our lips? Maybe you have that passage taped to your mirror, something you see first thing, and begin our day with an attitude of joy that the Lord has made this day and I'm going to rejoice in it as we've been enlightened to know who God is and what God's given to us, how much God loves us, how much God cares for us, that He'll give us strength to get through the hardship of the day. If we could begin our day that way, because we know the day is going to have many negative things it's going to throw at us. If you turn the radio on and you turn on the TV, you're going to have negative stories thrown at you all day, and it'll get us down and out. We need to start with positive and understand and allow God's Word to enlighten us and have joy that can overcome whatever circumstances we face for that day. That's what God's Word does for us. That's what Christ does for us. And Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, as he writes in Philippians. Our enlightenment can bring us joy. Our enlightenment brings us excitement and joy. And then finally this morning, back to the road to Emmaus. 
Backing up a little bit, tells us in Luke that as they approached the village where they were going, and Jesus acted as though he was going to go further. Jesus was traveling with them. They were about to Emmaus. Jesus was going to continue past the village or not stay in the village. And so they urged him, Cleopas and the other disciples, says they urged him, stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And that's when he reveals himself to them. But think about the idea. Jesus doesn't force Himself into anyone's life. He wants us to invite Him. He wants us to invite Him in. And when they invite Jesus, come, no, come and stay with us. Come and share a meal with us. He comes in and shares the meal. He doesn't force Himself on you. If you want to live your life contrary to the Lord, He'll allow you to do that. Even after the pot price that He has paid for us, He still allows us, you choose how you want to live. He's given His life for us, but He still allows us to live our own life, make our own choice. But He wants us to know what it is to be His disciple and what He will give to us and the strength we have through being His disciple. The revelation, we're told, as Jesus writes the letter to the church of Laodicea, as John reveals, and Jesus says to that church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus wants us to accept him. Jesus wants us to follow his instructions as to how to be his disciple. But we have to make that decision. He doesn't force Himself on us, again, even after all the price that He's paid. Is Jesus a stranger in your life on that road you're walking? Or do you recognize Him? Is He with you daily? Or is He just that outcast stranger that you don't have time for? We all have to make a choice about who Jesus is in our life. And if you're here this morning and you need to make that choice, you've never made that choice. You never turned away from your life of sin, confessed your faith in Jesus as God's Son. We have the evidence of it. It's happened. It's true. And God, Jesus lives. If you haven't obeyed Him and committed uh, to, submitted to Him in baptism to rise again to walk in newness of life, as we reenact that death and burial and resurrection, we come in contact with the blood of Jesus. You become a disciple of His. We begin to walk that road with Him, to be faithful unto death is our, is our goal. And we have that opportunity for you this morning. Or you just need strength as a brother and sister who has not allowed Him to walk with you on your road. I want to give you that opportunity to do that as we stand and sing this morning. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I cannot try. To take one step alone, I cannot bear the loads of life unaided. I need thy strength to lead myself alone. Be with me, Lord, and in if dangers threaten. In storms of trial, you'll burst above my head. If lashing seas leave everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord. When loneliness o'ertakes me, when I must weep amid the fires of pain, and which among the hour of my departure, all oh, the world's unknown, O oh, Lord, be with everyone here this morning. Come back tonight at five for another great lesson. We'll sing one verse of 860 and Brother Rob Carey will lead us in our closing prayer.
There is a habitation filled by the living God for all the ladies who seek that grand God. Before we have a closing prayer, I wanted to make mention of our church directory. We still have a lot of people that haven't signed up. Uh, Greg Shores has done a great job of putting that together, and it's pretty easy to do from your phone or your home computer. If you need some help, you can see either Gloria, Greg, or myself, and I'll try. If I can do it, anybody can. I'm not tech savvy, so it's pretty easy to do. Uh, are there any other announcements? If not, would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this blessed day. Father, aside from the blessings that we get on a daily basis, it's a wonderful day just to be alive. And we thank you so much for your love, your compassion, your forgiveness, your protection, all these things, Father, that you do for us that we may overlook. Father, we thank you so much for being patient with us. Father, we ask you to be with the Wilson family and the loss of Frank. I ask you to wrap your loving arms around broken hearts. Not only today, Father, but through the rough patches ahead, I ask you to be with them through these. Father, now as we go through our separate homes, I ask that we can stay united in our hearts with you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.